Welcome back, Unit 11. This is the start of the topic on stars and planets. This is what the front of your booklet would look like. So those of you home learning at the moment, you should have had this booklet delivered. Obviously, if you go and write your name, form, set and teacher on the front. As always, first page in the booklet gives you the equations and any SI multipliers, standard international multipliers there for foundation and for higher. There are no equations or additional equations that you need to be learning for this topic, but they're always useful to, to have there. Uh, close the gap marking as always, and the chapter summary um, on page three. And the chapter summary is pretty much everything that you need to know and learn. I've just highlighted down the bottom right here what's specific to higher tier and therefore not foundation tier. And if we start at the top here, look, the solar system consists of, this is what we'll be learning about today, one star, which we call the sun, eight planets, several dwarf planets, and many moons. Life is possible inside a band of space near to a star called the habitable or Goldilocks zone. Look at these, those two words there. Habitable, that means you, ha, you can live there. And the Goldilocks zone, you, you sometimes hear this phrase used quite a lot when we talk about Earth. And to understand it really, you need to understand or remember what, what the Goldilocks fairy tale story was all about. Look, there she is, Goldilocks. And if you remember that the, the fairy tale, she was walking in the woods one day and she came across the, the house of the three bears. Mommy bear, daddy bear and little baby bear. They'd gone for a walk in the woods. Goldilocks went into the house. And here she is, and she's helping herself to the porridge. And I think she took a taste of the first porridge. Oh, that's too hot. Second bowl of porridge, that's too cold. And the third porridge was just right. She, as you remember, she did the same with the chairs, the beds, uh, and other things in the house. But the point being, Earth, if there's, it's not a very good drone, is it? Earth is just at the right distance from the sun. If that's the sun, it should be a circle and not an elliptical, so I'll try again. There's the sun. The further you go away from the sun, the colder it gets. And the planet Earth is at just that right distance away from the sun where it's not too hot like the first porridge Goldilocks tried. It's not too cold like the second one she tried. Because if it's too hot, we, we'd be here somewhere. And if it's too cold, we'd be over here somewhere. Just right. So whenever you hear that terminology, Goldilocks zone, it's referring to that childhood story. Let's get started. On page four, can you write down lesson one? The title, Solar System, part one, because we're going to learn this over two lessons and today's date. A quick look at what we're going to be learning in lesson one and lesson two. In lesson one, you're going to be completing pages four to eight. And lesson one and two are mixed up together in terms of the learning objectives. What we are going to be doing today, though, in lesson one, is looking at the main features of our solar system. 
the order, size, orbits of, of the different planets in relation to the Sun. Get a feel for the scale of the solar system, but also we're going to be learning about two new units of distance, astronomical units and light years. That's not a bad place to start then. Let's look at this quote out of Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy book. Space is big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down to the road of the chemist, but that's just peanuts compared to space. But that's what we're going to look at first of all, really. We're going to look at a video in a moment and see and appreciate the size of distances between planets and the sun and well that fits into our galaxy and the universe. So the first thing I'd like you to do, because we need to understand this before we understand the size and scale of space, is to write here and here two new measurements which are the astronomical unit and, and the light year. Okay, so here's the definitions of those two. So if we just pause the video and write them down and I'll give a quick explanation after. Right, first of all then, and we're going to be using this in the, or learning about this I should say, in the next video, so I won't go into too much detail. If again then, this is the Sun, and this is the Earth, an astronomical unit is the distance between the Sun and the Earth. That distance there. And the short shortened version of it is 1 AU, astronomical unit, and that's 1.496 times 10 to the 11 meters. It's a long way. An even longer way is a light year, and basically a light year is the distance light travels in one year. Now, if you look at the spec, it says, yeah, recall that one astronomical unit is the mean distance from the sun to the earth and one light year is the distance that light will travel in one year. But be able to convert distances in light years into meters and be able to infer what a light minute or light second is. We'll do more of this again, but very quickly, a light year if I write this out in full, equals the distance light travels in one second, which is 300 million meters every second, or 3 times 10 to the 8. So that in brackets there is, a, is the distance light travels in one second, multiplied by <coughs> The number of seconds in a year. If you th think of what's a light second, a light second is just that, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters. But a light year, you then multiply by the number of days in a year, 365. Obviously, that's not a leap year. 365 would be the other years. Times the number of hours in a day, 24. 
times the number of minutes in an hour and then by the number of seconds and then you'd put that in your calculator and get the final answer there's another way of, sh of showing it just here again you could pause that and read through this to see if it it makes more sense but the answer look is there towards the bottom 9.46 times 10 to the 15 9.46 times 10 to the 15 And you can see that's there. Well, I feel a bit of a fraud starting off with lots of calculations of like using astronomical units. I'm just going to show you a quick video now, recently released on BBC Two of Planets, and this is the trailer. And just it, show, it shows how spectacular and thought provoking this topic can be. So. If you want to find out more about planets and solar system and so on, please watch this. Certainly watch this trailer, so as is part of the video, but go on then and watch more. It's on YouTube and BBC iPlayer to find more about specific planets. <laughs> Planets with Brian Cox on BBC Two and BBC iPlayer. Now to put the term astronomical units in the context, we're going to watch another clip from, I think it's the same series, Planets, which shows the enormity of firstly our solar system, but then secondly, the galaxy in which we live in, the Milky Way, and then finally the universe. The sun has a final invisible force that reaches out much further. Our star is by far the largest wonder in the solar system. In fact, it alone is 99% of the solar system's mass. It's this immensity that gives the sun its furthest reaching influence. Gravity. So its gravitational field dominates, and all the planets are bound gravitationally to it. The Earth, for example, 93 million miles away, also known as one astronomical unit. So let's represent that by one centimetre. And the most distant planet, Neptune, 30 astronomical units, so 30 centimetres. We then meet the Kuiper Belt objects of which Pluto, the ex-planet, is a member. They inhabit a region around 50 astronomical units. So that is the... Just to pause it there a second and make a point. That Pluto now is no longer classed as a planet. Neptune is the eighth and final planet from away from our solar system. Pluto is now classed as a dwarf planet. Uh, Brian Cox uh, used the, the term an ex-planet. used to be a planet. So if you were learning about the planets probably 20 years ago, then we'd be talking about Pluto being a planet. Right, so just remember that it's, it's called a dwarf, it's now a dwarf planet. Oh. 
all the planets and all the kind of belt objects out to Pluto. But it doesn't stop there. Beyond Pluto, space is a cocktail of extremely dilute gas and dust. Mostly just hydrogen and helium, left over from the universe's beginning at the Big Bang. But every now and then you encounter lumps of ice in vast orbits that take millennia to loop around the sun. And that cloud of snowballs is called the Oort Cloud. And astonishingly, the sun's grip is so strong that objects in the Oort Cloud keep popping up all the way to out here. Now that cloud of dirty snowballs, still gravitationally bound to the sun, extends out 50,000 astronomical units. On our scale, that's half a kilometre from the sun. And remember, the Earth was one centimetre away. This, then, is the full extent of the sun's empire. The lightest gravitational touch, which retains a cloud of ice, enclosing the sun in a colossal sphere. Beyond the Oort cloud, there is nothing. Only sunlight escapes. Light that will take four years before it reaches even the sun's closest neighbor. Proxima Centauri, a red dwarf star among the 200 billion others that make up the Milky Way. And it's by looking here, deep into our local galactic neighborhood, that we are learning to read the story of our own star's ultimate fate. Going back to your booklet then, we're back on page four. And We've learned about yeah, astronomical units and light years and you should have written those down now and have an understanding of those and know how to work out a light minute and a light second. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to write in here what the light minute is and what a light second is and obviously it's a measurement of distance so I want you to write down the values in meters so pause the video and do that now please and what you should have realized is that a light minute is the distance Light travels in one second, which is 3 times 10 to the 8, times the number of seconds in a minute, that's 60. So that's 180 times 10 to the 8. So a light second is easy, isn't it? It's just how far light travels in one second, and that's 3 times 10 to the 8. Now underneath there, or oh sorry, in between the two, there's a YouTube clip that Mr. Ruddy's included in the booklet for you to look at. And we're going to look at that now because it's it gives a real good understanding again as to as what the SI multipliers remember that they're on page one of the booklet and we, we use ten to the three is K or well, this could be kilometers if we deal in a distance ten to the nine would be giga and so on so i'm going to go down now and we're just going to look at this video together before we move on hope you enjoy it hope you're not too scared with the music <laughs> Thank you. 
Near the lakeside in Chicago was the start of a lazy afternoon, early one October. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now a field of view will be ten times wider. This square is ten meters wide, and in ten seconds the next square will be ten times as wide. Our picture will center on the picnickers, even after they've been lost to sight. One hundred meters wide. The distance a man can run in ten seconds. Cars crowd the highway. Power boats lie at their docks. The colorful beaches are soldiers' field. This square is a kilometer wide, 1,000 meters. The distance a racing car can travel in 10 seconds. We see the great city on the lake shore. 10 to the fourth meters, 10 kilometers. The distance a supersonic airplane can travel in 10 seconds. We see first the rounded end of Lake Michigan, then the whole Great Lake. 10 to the fifth meters, the distance an orbiting satellite covers in 10 seconds. Long parades of clouds, the day's weather in the Middle West. 10 to the 6th, a 1 with 6 zeros, a million meters. Soon the Earth will show as a solid sphere. We are able to see the whole Earth now, just over a minute along the journey. The Earth diminishes into the distance, but those background stars are so much farther away that they do not yet appear to move. extends at the true speed of light. In one second, it half crosses the tilted orbit of the moon. Now we mark a small part of the path in which the Earth moves about the sun. Now the orbital paths of the neighbor planets, Venus and Mars, then Mercury. Entering our field of view is the glowing center of our solar system, the Sun. Followed by the massive outer planets, swinging wide in their big orbits. That odd orbit belongs to Pluto. A fringe of a myriad comets too faint to see completes the solar system. Ten to the fourteenth. As the solar system shrinks to one bright point in the distance, our sun is plainly now only one among the stars. Looking back from here, we note four southern constellations, still much as they appear from the far side of the Earth. This square is 10 to the 16th meters, one light year, not yet out to the next star. Our last 10 second step took us 10 light years further, the next will be 100. Our perspective changes so much in each step now that even the background stars will appear to converge. At last, we pass the bright star Arcturus and some stars of the Dipper. Normal but quite unfamiliar stars and clouds of gas surround us as we traverse the Milky Way galaxy. steps carry us into the outskirts of the galaxy, and as we pull away, we begin to see the great flat spiral facing us. The time and path we chose to leave Chicago has brought us out of the galaxy along a course nearly perpendicular to its disk. The two little satellite galaxies of our own are the clouds of Magellan, 10 to the 22nd power, a million light years. Groups of galaxies bring a new level of structure to the scene. Glowing points are no longer single stars, but whole galaxies of stars seen as one. We pass the big Virgo cluster of galaxies among many others, a hundred million light years out. As we approach the limit of our vision, we pause to start back home. This lonely scene, the galaxies like dust, is what most of space looks like. This emptiness is normal. The richness of our own neighborhood is the exception. The trip back to the picnic on the lakefront will be a sped up version, reducing the distance to the Earth's surface by one power of ten every two seconds. In each two seconds, we will appear to cover 90% of the remaining distance back to Earth. Mm -hmm. Notice the alternation between great activity and relative inactivity, a rhythm that will continue all the way into our next goal, a proton in the nucleus of a carbon atom beneath the skin on the hand of the sleeping man at the picnic. Ten to the ninth meters, 
and the eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We are back at our starting point. We slow up at one meter, ten to the zero power. Now we reduce the distance to our final destination by 90% every 10 seconds, each step much smaller than the one before. At 10 to the minus 2, 1 one hundredth of a meter, 1 centimeter, we approach the surface of the hand. In a few seconds, we'll be entering the skin crossing layer after layer from the outermost dead cells into a tiny blood vessel within. Skin layers vanish in turn. An outer layer of cells. Selfie collagen. The capillary containing red blood cells and a roughly lymphocyte. We enter the white cell. Among its vital organelles, the porous wall of the cell nucleus appears. The nucleus within holds the heredity of the man in the coiled coils of DNA. As we close in, we come to the double helix itself. A molecule like a long, twisted ladder whose rungs of paired bases spell out twice, in an alphabet of four letters, the words of the powerful genetic message. At the atomic scale, the interplay of form and motion becomes more visible. We focus on one commonplace group of three hydrogen atoms bonded by electrical forces to a carbon atom. Four electrons make up the outer shell of the carbon itself. They appear in quantum motion as a swarm of shimmering points. At 10 to the minus 10 meters, one angstrom, we find ourselves right among those outer electrons. Now we come upon the two inner electrons held in a tighter swarm. As we draw toward the atom's attracting center, we enter upon a vast inner space. At last, the carbon nucleus. So massive and so small. This carbon nucleus is made up of six protons and six neutrons. We are in the domain of universal modules. There are protons and neutrons in every nucleus, electrons in every atom, atoms bonded into every molecule out to the farthest galaxy. As a single proton fills our seed, we reach the edge of present understanding. Are these some quarks in intense interaction? Our journey has taken us through 40 powers of 10. If now the field is one unit, then when we saw many clusters of galaxies together, it was 10 to the 40th or one and forty zeros. I hope you enjoyed that, that video. There's a lot to take in. It's a, that video is 44 years old, but still hugely relevant and accurate. And that's why Mr. Ruddy includes that in the booklet and would normally be showing that uh, in, in the classroom during lessons. I did mention, I was trying to pause the video, but um, some perhaps extraterrestrial spirit took over my laptop and didn't allow me to, to pause it. So I spoke over it very slightly. Just please remember that meters are spelt not like this in blue. If you were using an R meter or a vote meter, then meter is spelt that way with the E before the R. But distance is, is spelt with R before the E. And it was, that's still that same glitch will stop me rubbing that out. So it's R E S. You often see that, that misspelt more and more at the moment so when it's this when it's distance it's meters are spelled that way uh, just another another point the 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 narrator of that video didn't say capillary i can't remember exactly how how they said it capillary or something he said he said american do pronounce certain words slightly differently Tomatoes, tomatoes, potatoes, potatoes. They say tomatoes, we say tomatoes. They say potatoes, we say potatoes. Tomatoes, tomatoes, potatoes, potatoes. Let's call the whole thing off. It's a song. You might have heard it. So Americans spell things slightly differently, say things slightly differently. Aluminium. Aluminium. I can't remember how they say aluminium, but that's just, 
that's a, another strange one. Uh, but but also just think about what we saw there. We, the, the very largest things and the very smallest things. The very smallest things we saw at the end there were electrons going round. So I'm trying to show right, electrons going round the nucleus of an atom. And what what do we learn about today? The solar system. We've got the sun in the middle. And then we've got these planets going around the sun. And then the solar system is making up the galaxy that all rotate around the middle of a galaxy. So the very smallest and, and largest things work in a, in a similar way. Now, it is a slightly different topic, stars and planets. There's not lots of different calculations that you need to do. In fact, there's no equation that you need to be using. It's a topic where there is a little bit of book work and, and learning and remembering things like the orders of the planets, which we will come on to in a moment. Page five is, a, is an optional page, and you may be able to do it yourself. We just watched the, a video then looking at the whole of the universe. This is called the Drake Equation. The Drake Equation, and you, you can pause and read this yourself, is, is trying to answer the question, are we alone? Are there other living organisms or aliens out there? And the way to try and answer that is to use this very complicated equation. Again, it's something you don't need to do, but there's space on, on page five there for you to work it out yourself and come to your own conclusions. Skipping on now then to page six, this, this is something we're all going to do. And you need to read that paragraph and read the table underneath. So just pause the video now and do so. Okay, so this is a way of trying to get a feel and understanding and a quick way of notating how the planets that we can see underneath the table compare to the distance of the Earth away from the Sun and their own masses in comparison to the Earth and, and the Sun. Quick recap then. And this is, is a nice way of just showing our solar system and everything that's everything that's inside our solar system. And it'd be worth I'm just gonna leave that on the screen for a moment and not talk for ten seconds or more, because you might want to rewind back to this point on the video for future reference to help you answer questions you'd be moving on to next. So I'll give it 10 seconds. Something I haven't mentioned yet is the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt is between the inner and outer planets, the rocky inner planets and the gaseous outer planets, just there, okay. I mentioned about dwarf planets and Pluto being one of those dwarf planets. And in the video, the Brian Cox video, he talk, talked about comets are form, formed from ice and dust. Okay, now then, time for you to do a bit of, a bit of work and answer some questions. Before we do that though, let's make sure you understand this table. It's a very useful table because it helps you understand the relative the places of the planets in the solar system and their masses. And by using relative masses and radiuses, you can compare numbers more easily. So if you said, right, which is the largest planet? Well, straight away is this one here. 320. What does that 320 mean? Well, it, if you look above here, that symbol 
is further up here, and it's the it's the mass of Earth, six times ten to the twenty four kilograms. And you'll see that there is the mean radius. That's the radius of the Earth from the Sun, and that's why Earth is one because these planets are put in order of distance from the Sun outwards. What you need to do now are answer questions 1 to 4 underneath. Now Mr. Ruddy has kindly split up the questions and made them larger underneath here. So, for example, 1A is is shown here. I'll just highlight there. And so you just add answer, I should say, 1A underneath, then you've got 1B there, and, and so on. This is a self-assess series of questions. So what you need to do and answer questions one to four, and using you've got the graph there underneath at the bottom of page eight to help. And when you've finished all of those, then press play, and then you'll be able to mark your own work. Just try your very best, please. And remember to use the symbols that have been given here and above. Press pause now, please. Okay, so when you finish, I'll go through each each one in turn. And let's say, for example, that you weren't able to do 1A or 1B. Well, rather than watch all the answers that I gave now, look at the first one for 1A. And then see if you can do the others. It's far better to challenge yourselves than just to copy answers down. You're not learning much that way. So, 1A. What are the actual values in SI units of the following? Uh, the mean orbit radius of Mercury. Well, if you look, the mean orbit, orbit radius of Mercury is here. 0 .1 pen, 0 0.39. And that's being measured in astronomical units. An astronomical unit is is here, and which is 1.5 times 10 to the 11, rounded up. And then you just multiply the two together. If you look at uh, 1b, the radius of Jupiter. Well, for the radius of Jupiter, we're told here that it's 5.2 astronomical units. And okay, I just pause the video there. I just realized I'd made a mistake. I misread it's, it's asking to work with the mean radius of Jupiter, not the mean orbital radius. Let's make sure we understand the difference. The, the orbital radius, if this is the Sun and this is Jupiter. The orbital radius is the radius or distance of Jupiter from the Sun. It's actually asking for the radius of Jupiter itself, the planet Jupiter, which is a much smaller value, which is just that there, half half the diameter. So that's my error and perhaps I should have explained that earlier. So I'm just going to rub this out. And apologies if you've heard some music being played from next door. Alexa just sprang into life. Anyway, it's quiet now. Radius of Jupiter. Here it is, 11, and that's, that means the units here are 11 times the radius of Earth, which I've just underlined. 
So it's 11 times, and I'm just copying those numbers from the right hand side of the screen into the calculation. I'm given a three significant figures that's 70.01 times 10 to the, to the 6, and can be written down as 7.01 times 10 to the 7 meters. Part C, mass of Neptune. It's te the data is telling us it's 17 times more massive than Earth. The mass of the Earth is given there as 6.4, sorry, 6 times 10 to the 24 kilos, kilograms. Multiply that by 17. And obviously, tick your work, please, in red as, as you go along. I'll copy, so moving on to, if we look at um, 2, 3, and 4, draw a graph of orbital period against orbital radius. So I'm looking at question 2 here now. Draw a best fit line through your points. Then 3, the best fit line is not straight. What's the pattern of your data? And finally, just telling us the dwarf planet Pluto, an X planet, no longer a planet, has an orbital period of 248 Earth years. That means it takes 248 times longer than Earth to go around the Sun. Can you imagine living on Pluto? You know, Christmas once every 248 years. If if your year was 248 times longer. Okay, let's look at what that graph would look like. This is a tough graph to plot. There's no two ways about it. But before we go any further, make sure you understand the difference between the orbital radius I talked about earlier and the orbital period. Now, the period is the time it takes for a planet to go all the way around the sun. Now, the year, we think of that on Earth as one year, and one year is 365 days. So, uh, I suppose a leap year will be 366, so on average 365.25 days, if, if we're going to quibble about it. Anyway, let's not quibble, and let's look at the graph. Now, the easiest way to plot this graph is look at what I've highlighted in yellow and purple. Those are the two columns of data that need plot in. And look at the two largest values. I'd wish now I'd gone larger than 170 because it's asking us to work out what would be the, the value for Pluto. Anyway, I've plotted for 30, going up in, in threes on the x-axis and going up in 40s on the, the y-axis. That point there is the furthest planet, the eighth planet away, which is Neptune. And if we go zoom right in here, you can just about, and I'll try and highlight it in green there, that is Mercury. Here. So you can see the four inner rocky planets are very relatively very close to the sun. And the, so this one here is Mars. Then we've got the asteroid belt here, this area. And then the first planet after the, the asteroid belt. So coming down, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars is Jupiter. So there's Jupiter. Um, the question asks, what's the pattern or the trend? Well, the pattern or trend of the graph shows that the larger the orbital radius, the larger the orbital period. And that's common sense, isn't it? Because the bigger the radius, the further you've got to go around the sun, and therefore the longer it'll take. The very last question is asking, use your graph to predict the mean orbit radius of Pluto. So it's telling us then, 
this is the sun and this is Pluto. It's telling us the period or the time it takes for Pluto, the dwarf planet, to go around the sun. And it's telling us it's 248 Earth years. I mentioned that a short while ago. It wants us to work out ah, the, the radius, the distance from the sun to Pluto. And if we used our graph to do that, what I ideally need is a point here, 248. I'll, I'll extend the graph, and 248 would be around about here. I just put a little mark there. If I go across from there, 248 to around here somewhere. And if I extend this graph up there, and then come down here. That's why if I if I'd have changed the scale on the graph to 250, I could I could have fitted this in. Anyway, we just need an estimate. So if you look 27 to 30, I would say that's around about 30 35 AU. So Pluto's orbital P let me get this right now. No orbit radius. I'm taking the word in from there. Orbit radius and that's in AU equals thirty five AU. Now is it asking for it in years? Sorry, in meters, SI units, or will astronomical units do? Or oh, it's it's not stating one or t'other. Anyway, I'll give you the what that would be in SI units. In SI units. What we would do, we would multiply that 35 by the value of one astronomical unit, which is, which is, where's the astronomical unit gone when you need it? Let's zoom in and find it. I think it's 1.5 times 10 to the, 1.5 times 10 to the 11, there it is. So we multiply it by 1.5 times 10 to the 11, and then we're almost we're there. 1.5 times 10 to the 11. Okay, and that gives you 52.5 times 10 to the 11. Make sure, now then please ask the end of this lesson so that takes you to the end of page eight next lesson we're going to be learning more about the solar system that's why it's called solar system part two make sure please you completed the plenary assessment on study zone see you next time bye